Funding for this program provided by the members of KRWG. Become a member anytime online at krwg.org. Chamber funding provided by the Las Cruces Sun News and the Las Cruces Bulletin. Thank you so much for joining us for the Chamber Economic Forum. I'm Fred Martino. We're excited to have you with us tonight as we continue this series of special programs as we learn about what's happening in the economy right now and we also take a look toward the future. We're going to have opening statements in a moment and then questions from our studio audience, our experts from New Mexico State University, Dr. Jim Peach, who's going to be talking about the national economy, the regional picture from Dr. Chris Erickson and Dr. Ken Martin will handle the financial markets. And we begin with Dr. Peach. And Dr. Peach, certainly a lot of big news, even this week, uh, pertaining to the national economy. Sure, and before I start, thank you. We're all pleased to be back and thank KRWG and the Chamber and the other sponsors. Uh, this is always great fun. I should probably mention that uh, the demand for economists always increases when the economic news is bad, and so we, we enjoy this sort of thing. You know, many, many forecasters, especially in the last month or so, uh, have been using the R word, the recession word, and they've been doing so with an appropriately serious face so that they look believable and uh, want to convey the somber nature of what they have to say. Uh, the average forecast for real GDP uh, in the United States of uh, the 10 forecasting groups that I pay attention to has gone down a full percentage point from 3.2% to 2.2% for the remainder of this year, only in the last three weeks. I updated my uh, chart, they've come down a full percentage point. And we're likely to see a lot more doom and gloom in the next week or two. Now, the concerns of these professional forecasters, these groups, tend to be concentrated on what's been happening in the first six months of this year. That includes the Japanese earthquake and tsunami, which has disrupted supply chains in a lot of places, lower than anticipated U.S. real GDP growth, a still depressed U.S. housing market, uh, stubbornly high um, unemployment rates, the end of the stimulus program, uh, which will come very shortly, the financial woes of the European Union, uh, and of course the great fiasco often referred to as the U.S. debt ceiling debate. And all of these things have concerned forecasters. In the last week or so, it's been concentrated mainly on the Euro Eurozone, whether the EU can bail out Greece and then maybe Italy and Spain uh, and Portugal and how that might affect U.S. banks because our U.S. banks are tied to European banks as well. Some combination of these factors or some event we don't even know about could send the U.S. economy into a recession, but I doubt it. Uh, I think a more likely bet is that the U.S. economy will plot along with a relatively modest GDP growth rate for the remainder of the year, two, two and a half percent. Hardly anybody gets this stuff exactly right. Uh, bad things can happen, but there's no obvious reason why we're headed for a recession. Um, major U.S. banks are in much better shape than they were in 2007 and 2008. They have a lot of cash on hand. Their capital ratios that people look at all the time are in good shape. Um, households have reduced credit card debt per household. They've reduced both credit card and mortgage debt. The oil price uh, increases that we saw in the spring um, have disappeared. They've run their course. What I'd like to do is to tell you two little stories about the most contentious issue that we've been facing the last couple of months, and that's the deficit and the debt ceiling. And the first little story, and it'll only take a minute, is a story of a nation newly independent from a colonial power, uh, struggling to establish a government, 
a nation where per capita income in 2010 dollars per person income was about $300, maybe $400 per year, about a dollar a day, where the economy had little or no manufacturing, where the transportation system was essentially non-existent, where the banking and financial system was not working, um, where the vast majority of the population were illiterate, where it was not clear that the new government could survive, and where this new government had massive, massive debt. Uh, a debt that, if we could measure GDP back then, would be multiples of GDP. That nation was the United States in 1789. In 1790, a very remarkable Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, issued a report to Congress called the Report on the Credit of the United States. And in that report, he said, not only should we honor the debt that we have accumulated, uh, we must do that if we're to be a respectable nation, but here's how we can do that. Now, that was a real debt crisis. It, it was several times the debt of any kind of estimate of GDP at the time. Um, you know, uh, what we've got now is minor compared to other crises this nation has faced. Not only did we face the crisis in 1789 and 1790 when a bitterly divided Congress, many of whom wanted to repudiate the debt, we made massive investments in infrastructure over the next decade or so, uh, next two decades. We even built the nation's capital. Okay, now. Civil War, we had a financial crisis much worse than this. The financial panics of the 1890s, um, the uh, horrible things that were going on in the Great Depression, uh, the financial difficulties it, during World War II, what we've got now uh, doesn't even come close to those, and I'm confident that we'll find a reasonable solution to this. The second little story I'd like to tell you about the debt crisis is that the Congressional Budget Office came out within the last few days with their latest projections of the federal deficit for this year, fiscal year 11, and through uh, 2021. They lowered this year's estimate of the deficit to $1.284 trillion. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but only a few months ago they were projecting $1.6 trillion. So we're down to about $1.3. By 2014, their estimate of the federal deficit is $265 billion. And they do not have an estimate of a projected deficit exceeding $300 billion through the rest of their projection period to 2021. Now, do you seriously think we would have had the bitter debate that we did in July um, over the debt ceiling if our deficit in, uh, was um, 300 billion instead of 1.5 trillion that everybody was talking about? I don't think we would have even had the debate. I am absolutely confident that we can overcome any of those problems. Um, and, I am, and I am reasonably confident Forecasting is a dangerous, dangerous game. We're not headed for a recession. We're headed for modest growth. Do we have some problems that still linger from the 2007, December 07, beginning of the Great Recession? Of course we do. Housing is not fixed. The labor market is not fixed. Banks have $1.6 trillion in excess reserves, money that they could be lending that they are not lending. But we've got an awful lot going for us. No recession. Dr. Peach, as you know, <laughs> the narrative that continues, though, is that while this may not technically be a recession, to a lot of people, it feels like a recession. Sure. And I want to ask you something. That Congressional Budget Office report that you mentioned this week also had some other information in it. One piece of information was that they project that unemployment will remain above 8% until 2014. I know that's a tough question to answer quickly, but what kind that, of an effect will that have on our ability 
it, in this economy for people to feel like we're not in it, a recession. It, um, and, and that's likely to continue for some time. That's one of the reasons that they are only projecting a very modest rate of growth in GDP over the, over the decade. Um, the, labor, the labor market is a wreck. Um, we know how to fix that. We absolutely know how to fix that. We need a bigger stimulus. Uh, we need it now. Uh, there's no magic. There is no problem on the supply side. We can produce all of the goods and services that anybody wants to buy. If, if we have a problem, it is a problem of aggregate demand. And we do know how to fix that. I say we collectively, economists know how to fix that, policymakers know how to fix that. It is spending. And the only institution with enough size there to do the trick happens to be the federal government. I, you know, there's talk of a new uh, set of jobs programs. I would have a massive infrastructure program. Uh, there's plenty of work to be done in the United States that would increase the productivity of the private sector in the years to come. Uh, our roads are in terrible shape, our airports are in terrible shape, our schools for the most part are in terrible shape. Uh, we have all kinds of projects that are useful that can be done. I would do it and put people to work. We have nearly two million construction workers out of work. Okay, I'm sure we'll return to that topic as we continue our discussion with the audience in a few minutes. Now I'd like to move on to uh, Dr. Erickson for a look at the regional economy. Yeah, well. The state of New Mexico continues to be in recession. We have not really recovered from the recession. Our recession started later than the national recession. We've been in recession since uh, uh, October of 2008. We entered the recession about 10 months after the national economy, and we continue recession. Now, the last two uh, employment figures show very modest employment growth uh, statewide, and, and so we may be at the bottom. In fact, I suspect we are at the bottom, and I, next year we should have some moderate uh, economic uh, growth in the state. Um, so, uh, but we still face a number of, of, pos of problems going forward, and among those statewide are uh, federal fiscal um, uh, uh, federal fiscal cutbacks, uh, the kind Jim was talking about in relationship to the federal deficit. Uh, currently, the, we have the the, the uh, super committee that's looking at how to cut back the federal deficit. And there's a very large uh, possibility that they will target funding for Sandia and Los Alamos. Most experts think that the funding for those two institutions are on the block. Particularly, uh, Los Alamos was expected to uh, uh, receive funding for a new laboratory. That's likely not to come forward at this point, and, uh, and, and that's a negative for the state. Still, overall, I think the state's going to start doing better. I think that we're going to see about 2.2% uh, growth next year, uh, about 5% uh, 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 growth in wages and salaries. Uh, and um, uh, if you look at the state uh, budget, uh, we expect about $120 million in new funding uh, or new money for the state. Those are, those are funds that are available to expand existing programs or fund new programs. Now, $120 million isn't a lot. And I suspect that almost all that will be eaten up and making up for stimulus funds, which are coming to an end, and also will be used up in uh, funding Medicaid, which is with much of the funding in Medicaid, of course, falls to the state. Uh, but at least that's not negative numbers. It's not the negative numbers we've seen in, in the recent past. Uh, as you turn to the, uh, as you turn to the uh, local economy here in Las Cruces, we're in a double dip recession here in Las Cruces. Uh, 2000 and, um, uh, 2008 was a uh, 2009. Sorry, was a was a recession year. We peaked in 2000 in December 2008, and we uh, hit the bottom of the trough in December 2009. Uh, then 2010 was a, a pretty good year, and we peaked in December of 2010, and we've now been in negative growth in the city since December. Um, the reason for that uh, is multifold. Uh, first of all, the BRAC project, the base realignment uh, uh, and closure process that began in 2005 has come to an end. Now, uh, uh, particularly Fort Bliss, but also uh, White Sands Missile Range were recipients of troops 
under the BRAC process, and I estimate that that added about 1% to the growth rate of the local economy between 2005 and 2010. That's ended, so that 1% stimulus we've been having is, is over with. Uh, another problem that we um, have, of course, is that, Los, is that uh, uh, NMSU has uh, received less funding from the state. Funding for NMSU is down 17% from its peak. That, that's been made up partly with tuition increases, but of course tuition increases come out of the pocket of students, which means they have less to spend locally. And um, we've also made up for this uh, cut in funding through attrition. Uh, there's less employment in MSU now, and all this is a negative for the, the local economy. Real estate has also been a sore spot for the local economy. For the first two years after the start of the Great Recession, our real estate was doing okay, but in the last two years, uh, we've caught up with the national uh, with the national real estate market and have seen a pretty sharp decline of three and a half percent or so in housing prices and also decline in in sales. Moreover, a, a, a pretty substantial portion of our uh, sales in the last uh, year have been uh, distressed properties uh, sold either with threat of foreclosure or actually have been foreclosed on, uh, and that's a, a problem. And um, but still, there's some pauses for the local economy. Uh, Spaceport America continues to, its construction. It'll be done, I think it's scheduled to be done about the end of this year. Uh, and then uh, we expect to see the uh, new train depot to begin uh, um, uh, a major phase of its construction in the fall, and that'll be a good stimulus for the, for the local economy. Taking as a whole, I expect to see slow, steady growth next year for our economy. I expect us to be moving into positive territories in the next few months and then positive next uh, year, but I, I don't see us booming like we had been prior to the beginning of the recession, that two, two and a half percent growth that we were seeing prior to the Great Recession. Dr. Erickson, this is a tough uh, question, but you uh, referenced the fact that New Mexico depends heavily on federal spending, and you, you address the jobs part of that. I mean, we, we have a lot of jobs connected to federal funding. We also have an enormous reliance on federal funding for our Medicaid program, which has grown substantially uh, during this economic crisis. If you were a policy maker uh, right now, and you know the landscape here that down the line, federal funding is likely to be cut. What are some of the things you would be doing to ensure we have some way to make up uh, lost ground, uh, or at least tread water when, when federal funding is gonna be cut? Well, that, that is a tough question. I think that it's gonna be very difficult to make up for substantial cuts in federal funding. Uh, you know, we, I mentioned already Los Alamos and Sandia, which uh, I, I'm not saying those programs would be cut, but the projected uh, growth that they have been seeing and the, and the continued growth that they've been seeing over the last decade is unlikely to continue. It's very hard to make up for those kind of things. The only thing you can do is work on attracting businesses in the, in the private sector. And, and, and that, it, it seems that the state is only using one tool when it comes to attracting uh, private sector investment, and that's uh, tax cuts. Unfortunately, tax cuts also mean that you're cutting services, and um, uh, in, the, in determining where to locate, businesses often look at the overall cost of doing business. So if you're gonna locate a business into an area, yes, you do wanna pay less in taxes, but you also want to have good schools for your children. You also want to have good roads. You also want to have low transportation costs. And so I see that as a, as a, a very difficult to get past that idea that the only instrument we have is tax cuts. We also have to work on quality of life to attract people. We have to work on providing the service that people want uh, to get them in. But the only solution, I think, is the private sector, and that's a tough road to hope. I, are, you, are you making an argument for incentives for the, the private sector that have some kind uh, of, I, a, of a guarantee that the jobs created have a certain pay level, that the jobs created will last a certain th amount of time? That, that can work, but actually the, the evidence you see now, of course, that, and, that, and that particularly it works in the short run, but the evidence you're seeing now more and more is what they call economic gardening, where you start trying to grow local businesses that have deep roots in the community and who care about the community. 
Because the problem is when you bring people in using incentives, when the incentives run out, which they ultimately will do, you end up having, um, uh, you end up having them relocate to other, other, back to where they came from or to other areas. And so, yes, selective incentives to get people to move here are fine, but then once you get them to move here, you've got to have the, the incentives in place and the, and the infrastructure and the community and the, the, uh, to get people to stay and to grow their business here, here locally. Very tough situation and uh, tough to answer that one. I appreciate yeah. the information there. Dr. Ken Martin uh, is going to tackle the financial markets and what a roller coaster you've been on for the past couple of months. <laughs> it's been unbelievable. <laughs> I, I started writing my notes and I, I titled this, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Economic Forum. Because for, for many months, starting at the first of the year, the stock market was relatively quiet. It was ranged in a, a, a band on the S&P 500 between about 1250 and about 1350. Um, there was the Japanese earthquake and tsunami that caused a little hiccup in March, but then the market seemed to recover. And then, the bottom fell out. And there were, so I want to talk about three things. One is what happened. Secondly, what's coming up? What can we kind of keep our eye on? And, and third is what's, what's an investor to do uh, as a result of this? Um, so what happened? Well, there were three kind of major shocks that hit all around the end of July, 1st of August, and that was uh, the culmination of the debt ceiling debate. Uh, that uh, did not create a lot of confidence on the part of uh, the investing public and uh, uh, the, the resolution of that actually created more uncertainty because of the super committee in Congress that will uh, decide on further uh, budget cuts. Uh, the second thing was that Standard & Poor's downgraded the U.S. Treasury debt from AAA to AA+. Plus based on their lack of their perceived lack of faith in the political process uh, for the government to um, engage in more fiscal prudence. And the third thing was that uh, the, the uh, interest rates on Italian and Spanish debt uh, really uh, jumped up. And so traders were worried about a credit crunch, about growth in the Eurozone, uh, so there were concerns about uh, economic activity in Europe. And then compounding this was the actions of high-frequency traders who trade uh, in milliseconds and uh, can uh, really kind of uh, move markets in a flash. Um, you, know, you may have heard uh, that maybe man versus machines now on the, in the markets, but it's really kind of man and machines because investors were getting panicky and the machines were taking over and submitting uh, lots of orders and, and driving some of that market. Now, uh, arguably, uh, there's a lot of debate about high frequency traders and whether they are beneficial or not. Uh, um, on the one hand, they, uh, they do provide liquidity, they do step in uh, and, and trade. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they provide uh, a lot of volatility in the market. Okay, so what's coming up? Um, well, uh, as we speak, uh, the uh, uh, Fed is having a uh, annual meeting. Um, I think it's the Kansas, sponsored by the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Ben Bernanke will uh, make an address on Friday, August 26th, and, and people are watching that very, very closely. He used that forum last year to uh, announce and talk about QE2, quantitative easing program. Uh, and so people are, are wondering what he's gonna say and speculating about what he's gonna say. Um, also on, on Friday the 26th, uh, consumer sentiment numbers will be released. Uh, consumer sentiment, consumer confidence has just fallen off the table. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Peach. There's no reason for us to have a, a recession unless we talk ourselves into it. And all of this uncertainty uh, has, I think, really impacted uh, consumers. And, uh, you know, there's still a chance that we do fall into recession. Coming up next week is uh, 
the, the employment numbers. Uh, we'll get some insight in, as to how employment is doing. And the ISM index is a key indicator. ISM is the Institute for Supply Management. It's a, sur a national survey of purchasing managers and what they are doing, uh, what they are thinking, and, and uh, the orders they're placing looking forward. Um, so, uh, and uh, one more thing is that uh, on September 8th, uh, the European Central Bank meets. Jean-Claude Trichet uh, will uh, have a press conference afterwards, and people watch him just as closely as Ben Bernanke, especially given the turmoil in Europe. Um, so what's an investor to do? Well, you know, there are a lot of positives out there. There really are, in spite of all this uncertainty and this market turbulence that's going on. Um, you know, I feel a bit like uh, a, a weather forecaster in the uh, 1800s standing uh, in the Gulf Coast, and, and he, you see the waves kick up, you see the wind blowing, the, the, winds, uh, the, the, the clouds on the horizon, and you wonder, is this just a squall or is this a hurricane coming? I don't really know. We don't have satellites to, to tell us. Um, but we do know we're standing on firm ground, and there are some firm, some firm ground here. Uh, corporate earnings are extremely good. Profit margins are very high. And valuations in the stock market are very reasonable. Uh, you, we have to remember that home economics is not corporate economics. That is, what's going on in the U.S. economy is not the same as what's happening with corporate earnings. Because many of the large corporations derive many of their revenues and much of their earnings from overseas and particularly emerging markets, which are still growing. Um, insider buying is at uh, record levels. So the, the corporate managers, the CEOs who are seeing what's happened to their stock prices, they know what's going on in their companies, they're stepping in and making significant buys. Uh, inflation is low, interest rates are very low. It's very cheap, if you wanna borrow money, if you can borrow money, then uh, there's no better time because interest rates are at very, very low levels. Couple that with panicky retail investors, that's a contrary indicator. And so uh, there are a lot of positives that stack up on the side of stepping into the market at this time when, when fear is at a peak. Nice to end those statements with uh, some positive news for sure. We'll be talking positives and negatives, I'm sure, as the hour continues. And we've come to the portion of our program, for the rest of our program, where we will take questions from our studio audience. And we ask our audience members not to be shy to get up there to the microphone right now uh, and just give your name and where you're from and then ask your question. And they can be uh, on any topic related to the economy, whether it be the financial markets, as we just heard from Dr. Martin, or uh, to talk about the regional uh, economy or the national economy. There are big changes and lots of interest in all of those areas. And as we wait for that first brave person to come to the microphone, uh, I want to reference a New York Times article this week, an editorial, and it will begin with how important is the housing crisis? The housing numbers are chilling. These are the words of this editorial in the New York Times. Sales of ex existing homes fell in July by 3.5% while prices were down 4.4% from a year earlier. In all, prices have declined 33%, one-third since the peak of the market five years ago for a total loss of home equity of, get this, $6.6 trillion. Dr. Erickson, you addressed the housing market locally here, not as bad as some places uh, around the country, but those numbers are staggering. Can we get a recovery without having a housing recovery? Yeah. Yeah, uh, recessions that are associated with uh, financial crises like the recession we're in currently tend to be longer. They tend to last five years versus the two years from, from bottom back to full recovery. Uh, and they tend to, and the, one of the reasons why they tend to take longer period of time is because wealth has been destroyed. That the housing prices are down and people are feeling the pinch and they don't feel as rich as they were and they're not willing to go out and spend. 
And, uh, and, and so, it, yes, we can get a recovery if I recover in the housing market, but it sure would be nice if we could, could get a recovery in the housing market or at least stop the decline and turn around and start the, the uh, uh, recovery. One of the things, if you look at the data historically, is that housing tends not to appreciate very much in value over time. Yes, houses now are nicer than they were 10 years ago. Yes, they have better, uh, they have, uh, uh, better uh, uh, insulation, they have more square footage and things like that. But when you just take a, an existing house and you compare it to its value, say, 10 years ago, of that existing house, which then controls for all those other little things like uh, uh, you know, the, the size of the house and such, you find that houses tend not to appreciate very rapidly. Now, an exception of that, of course, was the 19, uh, was, the, was after the, the uh, 2000 and the 2000, 2005 up to the beginning of the current recession. There we saw a sharp appreciation in housing that really in some ways was unprecedented. The 33% decline we've seen in housing really is going back towards trend. Actually, maybe we're a little bit below trend, and that kind of an overshoot that you sometimes see would, to me, actually indicate a positive. I think we're probably at the bottom of the housing market right now, uh, and we're likely to see an upturn in the housing market over the next year or so. There are a lot of people watching right now who hope you are well, right. Including me, sure. I am a homeowner, I so I, too, I'm, I'm hoping and so it too. It is scary. We're going to get to our uh, first audience question now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Peach, I, I totally agree with your evaluation of the situation we have so far as debt and our ability to do things and so forth. You know, I, I go back to the FDR time, you know, you know uh, he started off at the, when he first came into office and then created all kinds of programs. And then people got a little scared and around 37, 38, uh, you know, uh, he got a lot of people uh, more on the conservative side were saying, well, we've got to get a hold of our budget, we've got to reduce payments, and he cut back, you know. And quite frankly, the thing that uh, allowed us to get out of our depression was World War II, you know, which is, from my mind, is a huge stimulus program. And right now, I mean, the, 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 we just are in a very negative thought process. Many economists are, not all of them, I wish I, there are more of us, and I'm an economist myself, that would look at this a little more realistically and look at it more from the Keynesian side, which is kind of what we started to do back in the Great Depression. But right now, that's gone in the tank. That whole thinking that the way you get out because consumers aren't spending and businesses aren't investing because consumers aren't spending, and as you indicated, the only, you know, the large, so far as entity out there is the government. And so the only way we can start to get people back to work to use all the resources out there is for them to make the investments in the infrastructure, as you indicated, and a number of other things. But we have this negative kind of feeling out there. That's just, that's just not the right way to go. How do we change that negative to a positive? This is not the first time this nation or even Congress has been bitterly divided. That was part of my story about 1789. And if you want to go back and read some of the language that was used then or throughout the 19th century and in other things, um, we, can, we, can, we can overcome this. And I think the way we will do that is that the deficit is going to shrink. And I think the anger level will shrink as well. Um, Okay, and we do have another question from an audience member. Ron Communis, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, again, for putting this on. There's some new concerns, in my opinion, with the national economy and what impact this hurricane's going to have. Up and down, they're saying 10 million people could be affected. We've seen the results on the billions of dollars being used by the government to pay for infrastructure repairs, etc. Then we had this earthquake also yesterday in, in areas that were not earthquake fitted and there will be some claims and damages. What impact will these two disasters have on our current economy and the possible loss of property and lives down, the, you know, in this next week or so? Okay. Uh, actually, very little. 
Uh, the, only, the only natural disaster I can think of in recent times that has disrupted an economy uh, in any serious way was the Japanese earthquake and tsunami uh, this spring. Uh, what we're looking at uh, from a single hurricane, even if it were the size of Katrina, uh, or this mild earthquake that we had on the East Coast, even if that amounts to some tens of billions of dollars, which would be an, probably an exaggeration, this is a $14 trillion economy. And that's, that's almost not observed at a decimal point. Um, the other thing about that is we, we had perhaps this spring 40 or $50 billion in damages in the collected natural disasters of the drought in Texas, the tornadoes, all of that other stuff. And you know the ultimate effect on GDP? That, it, it's a sad thing to say, but those things typically increase gross domestic product. You have to rebuild all that stuff, and that's current production. It, uh, it, it's, it's a sad thing, but true. Very interesting. All right, moving on, another question from our audience. Hi, my name is Michael Walsh. I'm from Las Cruces. And I've got a question that sort of goes from the whole national thing about real estate down to the very basics of any individual here. And that is, if people who have a mortgage owe more on their house than their house is worth, what's the sort of national solution or the personal solution? Should they just say, goodbye. Like in Arizona, there's no recourse, I guess. You know, you can just declare bankruptcy, foreclosure, and you, you, there's no real penalty. They can't go after you. Or should the banks just, you know, let's say, okay, everyone, let's cut, the, cut your mortgage just down by 50%. And before, we'll just eat the loss. And before we get to the answer to that, I have two more graphics and uh, two more statements from the New York Times this week on this very issue. Uh, we've talked about how important housing is. Now, will it get worse? There is no let up in sight. Currently, 14.6 million homeowners owe more on their mortgages than their homes are worth. That's you know, nearly half of them are underwater by more than 30%. At present, Three and a half million homes are in some stage of foreclosure. Nearly six million homeowners have already lost their homes in the bust. Our audience member addressed solutions, and the New York Times editorial concludes with that. They say, reducing principal is a better solution than lowering interest rates because it reduces payments and restores equity. Bankers resist because it could force them to recognize losses they would prefer to delay. The administration has resisted in part because principal reductions are seen as rewarding reckless borrowers. This is an incredibly important question, and I'm glad an audience member asked this about solutions. Uh, Dr. Peach, I mean, this week, in addition to all of those numbers in that editorial, we learned that in the first quarter of this year, 8.5% of folks who have a mortgage, who haven't lost their homes yet, 8.5% missed a payment. Normal is 1%. 1%. Do you agree with the idea that some have of a solution being that that somehow principal has to be reduced. Time is, a, is the solution here in some sense. What the housing market is certainly not fixed. And at our first forum that we did in here, uh, I said in very simplistic terms that if you want a single indicator of when we're really out of this great recession, it will be when housing markets recover. And it's, that's too simple but that's a pretty good indicator. If, if you're underwater in your house right now, if you're not gonna move someplace and you're not trying to sell it, what difference does it make? A colleague of mine this morning told me that he had made on paper a whole lot of money buying gold in the last couple of months. And that's not real unless he cashes that in. 
So you believe and, rather, rather and than... And neither, neither is being underwater a serious problem if you can still make the mortgage payment if you're not trying to move, not trying to sell your house. So you believe that the federal government uh, should wait and, and see if time can correct this rather than any additional no. programs that... I, I, I think that as a part of the initial stimulus package, we should have had a serious housing program. And uh, so again, being was, too simplistic, this crisis started in housing. Uh -huh. The credit wasn't enough then, is what you're saying. We, the, we didn't provide credit to housing markets. Uh, not for from the individuals government. to buy homes, the, the, the credit that was provided, the tax credit. Oh, that, that's not real cash. You gotta have income to offset that. Unemployed people uh, don't much care about a tax credit. Okay, Dr. Erickson, you want to get in on yeah, this? Well, I like to make a, a pitch for a policy that uh, often gets a, a black eye, but actually can work in a situation like that, and that's inflation. If we were to have 5% inflation a year for five years, that's 15% increase in the, in the value of, of assets. Real estate, which is a very good inflation hedge, would likely increase by that 5% a year. Now, of course, the problem is the banks would take a hit from that. The banks don't like it. I would take a hit from that because I uh, am a, a net lender, not a net borrower, like many of you who have money in, in, in various and 401ks and such. But the fact of the matter is the banks should take a hit. The bankers lent funds to people who could not repay them. The bankers are the experts. They're the ones who are supposed to know what they're doing. For people to say that people were borrowing who didn't know who uh, uh, were taking unnecessary risks, certainly many were in that category, but many were naive and didn't know what was going on. And so, for the bankers to take a hit, and a way to do that is through inflation. It doesn't mean you're not rewarding people who are who were. Um, uh, taking undue risk, you're rewarding people, everyone in the market that way. You're helping people who have equity and people who don't. And so uh, it's not a popular policy. People don't like it. But if you think about it, it would work to solve the real estate problem. Okay. Dr. Martin? And I would uh, follow up on that by saying that's, I think, what uh, the Federal Reserve is trying to do. They want some inflation in the economy. When we see inflation in the economy, then we see that there's some growth coming in. And um, we don't, Ben Bernanke knows what deflation can do to an economy, and we don't want to see that. So inflation is a preferred solution, uh, but the, the bigger picture is also that we're in a big deleveraging environment individuals are cutting debt as as fast as they can um, and, and, and apparently people don't believe we're at quite at the bottom yet because yeah. while we have record low interest rates now again uh, mortgage applications this week at a 15 year low that is another right. stunning right. statistic I mean we uh, could do the entire hour, I think, this time was these statistics. We do, though, have very, another... Very quickly, though, the Federal Reserve has flooded the markets with liquidity, and that has not resulted in inflation. Okay. I don't, you know, yeah. there, there's a real question about the ability of the Federal Reserve to create some and, inflation. And we'll hear more from yeah. the Federal Reserve Chair on Friday. Now we're going to hear from another one of our audience members. Thank you. Uh, my name's Don Pearson. Uh, we seem to have a, we live in a capitalist society, but we've got an extreme disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. The big corporations that are banks that are making record profits is at the expense of American workers, wages, and benefits. How in our s system can we try and reconcile that dichotomy so that we can get more on a level field? Is that by reducing, you know, investors' expectations on profitability, or how do we do that? Talk about a yeah. tough question. Yeah. <laughs> now, there, there are actually, there, there are a number of things that can be done. One, one thing that most observers of the system would agree on is, our, our federal tax system is a mess. Um, we, we have so many loopholes. We have a tax code that no individual 
should ever have to read. Uh, we, need, we need to start there. Uh, and, and in my view, we need to have a decently progressive tax system. And for okay. folks who want to read more about that, they should know that if they do a search on NewYorkTimes.com this week, you will find an editorial from one of our nation's richest men, Warren Buffett, who talks, Dr. Peach, I don't know if you've read the editorial, about this very thing and about the fact that in our tax system uh, that by and large, the very wealthy pay 15 percent uh, of their 15 uh, percent yeah. tax rate because yeah. a lot of the income does not come from payroll. And it comes from investments, etc. That's correct. And strictly in terms of the income tax, we have a large number of households who do not pay income tax. Nearly everyone who works at the bottom pays the payroll tax, the Social Security tax. Um, but I, but I think from top to bottom, Mr. Buffett presented an interesting argument. He thinks billionaires should be taxed more, and I tend to agree with him, but he's welcome to write a big check to the federal government anytime he wants to. But he isn't going to. Uh, probably not. Right. Yeah. Okay, another question from an, our, our audience. follow up on the last question. My name's Al Kissling. Uh, I'm concerned because corporations seem to be sitting on their money even laying off people, but not hiring. Is there anything that can be done, government or otherwise, to get these corporations to begin to invest in America? Yeah, I, I, I'll say that at one point uh, here a couple weeks ago, uh, Apple Computer had more cash on hand than the federal government. <laughs> and uh, it is a major problem, and of course it represents a, a, uh, uh, a a high level of risk aversion towards uh, investing in, uh, in the, the economy. And yes, we have both unemployed capital in the form of idle cash and unemployed people. And normally you'd expect that unemployed capital and unemployed people to get together and create jobs. But that's not happening in this recession because of a lack of confidence. It goes back to the fact that this is a financial crisis a recession caused by a financial crisis which takes longer to work through. People are gun shy right now. In one sense, time heals. There are things that the government can do to uh, reduce the risk and get businesses more on track. Among them are a stable, understandable tax system that Jim was talking about. Other things include uh, a stable regulatory environment, no new major regulatory programs to, uh, that could potentially cause business to be uncertain. That's difficult right now because, of course, in 2014 we have the, the health care reform coming online of which businesses are uncertain about because we don't know what it's going to look like yet. They're still writing the regulations. And I think it's going to be a little while before we overcome that problem. Not an easy problem to solve. Okay, another question from our audience. Hi, my name is Martina Myers, and I'm a pro professor here at NMSU and also an advocate for the faculty. Um, Dr. Peach, I've thanked you before. I'll thank you again. The clear insights into discussing spending, government stimulus, I'm very appreciative to hear that in the arguments today. Uh, my question is for you, Dr. Erickson. At the state level, how do we, I grew up in a generation where we heard that building a strong middle class builds democracy. And that was part of the reasons that I received all throughout my education of why we invest in education. Increasingly also, you know, we're investing in, in health care, the discussions of Medicaid. How do we educate our state legislators that our investments in education carry long-term returns? That we've cut educators, K through 12, and higher education we're cutting into the meat of our communities and we're not ser uh, serving our, our, our students and our future generations on any levels. Any insights into that? Well, I, I think our legislators are aware of this. But the problem is that they're so afraid to raise taxes, even where those taxes go to fund things that are clearly in the best interest of society. When we talk about the fact that uh, the future generation, uh, surveys recently have said that uh, people are afraid uh, that the future generations will not have the same standard of living as the current generation. Well, one way to guarantee that is not to fund education. 
Uh, it's a very short-sighted legislator that doesn't support education. On the other hand, I have to say that here in New Mexico, a larger portion of our state budget goes to education than is true in most states. A larger portion goes to higher education than is true in most states. Nevertheless, uh, we also have a relatively small tax base, uh, being a relatively poor state, and we need to do something to maintain education. And of course, the truth in, edu in, in, in uh, advertising here, my wife is a math teacher at Onyate High School. I'm sorry, math. Now I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Science teacher at Onyate High School. Uh, and um, uh, they've just now had to go to a new program at the high school because of budget cuts where teachers are working longer hours and have less prep time. That, the teachers are fine with that. It's still an eight hour day that they're putting in, or most teachers I think put in more like a nine or 10 hour day when you average everything out. But, but the, what they're concerned about is they don't have as much time to prepare for the students. And you're gonna get a lower quality education when you have teachers working longer hours. It's just the way it is because they're, they can't give the same quality of homework and quantity of homework they would give if they have 80 students versus 120 students, and that's just the way it is. Picking up on this education issue, Dr. Peach, I know we talked about this in the last Chamber Economic Forum, that uh, one other issue related to this is that when folks are graduating, if they're not in a field where there is high demand, like healthcare, they may not be able to get a job. Uh, and this is really, uh, appearing like it's going to be a long-term uh, problem in this economy because of the fact that it, the labor market, at, according to the Congressional Budget Office this week, is going to be in trouble for years to come. What does that do uh, to the psyche and what does that do then to our overall economy? For, first, at the, at the college level, the unemployment rate among college graduates is about half the rate of the general population. <clears throat> if you have a graduate degree, it's even lower than that. The unemployment rate among high school dropouts has always been significantly higher than whatever figure we have at the national level. Um, you, <coughs> that, the conclusion from that, a conclusion, is pretty clear. Uh, you've got a much better chance of getting a job and especially a much better chance of getting a decent job if the more education you have. The, the fact is that a high school dropout is ill prepared even to drive a truck these days. You think about a semi truck going down the road and the cab alone costs 250, maybe $500,000. You've got a six or $700,000 rig and you load two or three million dollars worth of stuff into it and you want a high school dropout who cannot do arithmetic and who cannot read instructions and can't operate the computer controls in, in that rig, not a chance. If you're a high school dropout, your income level has already been determined for life unless you win the lottery. But we have other problems that we have not addressed in this country. We have not seriously addressed health care, energy, and why we spend time debating something like the deficit or the debt that we know how to solve in an instant and don't concentrate on these other issues is beyond me. Dr. Martin, last time when we talked about this very issue and the labor market, one of the things that we talked about that certainly relates to uh, stock prices and our global economy is that over the last decade, uh, corporations have very often gone overseas and increased employment while reducing employment in the United States. Do you see any possibility uh, with what's happened in this recession to reverse that tide at all? I mean, we have seen examples like General Motors drastically reducing wages. So you have a two-tiered wage system at certain plants where uh, em you know, employees are making as little as $14, $15 an hour. Well, corporations uh, have uh, held the line on, on labor costs, and that uh, directly leads to uh, increased uh, profit margins in general uh, for the corporate sector. 
Um, and real incomes have not gone anywhere for quite a while. Um, With the lower wages, I mean, is there is there any hope in your mind that that more companies will keep jobs and maybe even increase employment in the United States, or will we continue to simply see more jobs offshored? Because even at fourteen or fifteen dollars an hour, uh, you know, there's cheaper labor uh, in other countries. There may be cheaper labor, but there may not be better labor. I mean, it's a quality of, of uh, product and quality of labor issue as well. Uh, it's not just a cost. And so uh, to the extent that we can uh, increase the productivity of the American labor force, and um, which goes along with the, the educational level and the quality of the education that the students receive so that they become productive uh, workers, uh, then I think we can succeed in, in reversing that trend. So you do see uh, some hope. If productivity has gone way up, and you mentioned General Motors, and I'll mention the automobile industry, do you know how much labor there is in the assembly of an automobile? About 14 hours. I don't give a hoot what you pay those people for 14 hours. It still doesn't add up to a forty dollars or $50,000 automobile. You can pay them $100 an hour. I, I don't care how you load it with benefits or anything. In the direct labor to assemble an automobile, it's a very minor part of the cost of producing a car. All right, very interesting now. stuff. And we thank you all for your insight. We've run out of time. We thank our studio audience. And we thank you at home. Because without you and your membership, we would not be able to present in-depth local programming. You can become a member anytime at krwg.org. Thank you and good night.